I guess we're ready to kick it off then, aren't we? Hello. The following podcast is a conversation with my good friend Mike who, following his disillusionment with the UK after the failed COVID lockdowns, decided to take his family on an adventure and look at setting up a new life in Latin America, in Paraguay. The conversation explores some of the trials and tribulations uh, that he encountered uh, during this adventure. Um, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome, Mike, to the uh, Fear Free Speak Easy podcast, pretty much our inaugural podcast in our new podcast room. So thank you ever so much for uh, coming along and sharing your insights with us. So um, Thanks for inviting me. Just Thank you. Yep. Um, just to kind of set the scene, really, and, and to give everybody a flavor of um, really why I wanted to have a chat with you, because... I think like many of us, you know, we've always liked the idea of living abroad and moving abroad and going somewhere where it's constantly hot, you know, because all of us Brits are always moaning about the weather here. And um, and you actually did it. So uh, or you're in the process of doing it. So I think, you know, actually uh, and you took a very different road to a uh, road to what most people do, you know, actually going to Latin America. So you're kind of living the Latin American dream <laughs> rather than the American dream. Um, and I think, you know, that it's a really interesting story, you know, obviously we're, we're friends. Um, so I followed your story quite a bit as you've been sort of, um, dealing with uh, some of the challenges and, um, the fun and games of, of moving <coughs> abroad or, or looking at um, and being a gringo, abroad. being a gringo in Latin America. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of, most people, they, um, they say, I want to, I want to emigrate. I want to move abroad. And they don't really look that much further out past Europe. And um, that's always because you look at what's the main attraction. It's the weather. It's, it, it usually sometimes it's a little bit, you know, the economics of it. But usually it's around, well, I just want better weather, um, better food and um, better quality of living. And, uh, and I think really for like decades until recently, that's always been the case, isn't it? It's always been the case that you could, you could find that within Europe. I, I think, um, I mean, my, my own parents moved out to Europe um, and they went to France and the, the one of the regrets that they always kind of had was that they ended up going somewhere where the weather wasn't actually a lot better than the UK. Yeah. You know, and my yeah. dad, um, when he was still with us, you know, was often kind of reticent about maybe they should have gone to Spain because mm. they would have had the sun there. You know, they didn't really get much better weather when they went to, um, to Brittany. No, so. Exactly. Exactly. The, no, the grass isn't always greener. and um, But I think, <clears throat> you know, I looked at it and I was never really that um, keen to, to, to emigrate. I was never really that keen to move overseas. And um, because I kind of felt the same, it was like, well, look, wherever we go, it's going to be sort of pound for pound the same, you know. And then there's going to be the issue with language barriers and all that. So we're going to have to learn another language. Um, but then, uh, someone had said, in, sort of mentioned Paraguay to me, um, I think it was in 2021, so it would have been summer of 21, about how they were going to move out to Paraguay. And they had sort of pitched a, <clears throat> there was a European settlement out there that they were looking to move to, and they said it looked very good, and they would looked at it online, and it was sort of ticking a lot of boxes. And I was also at that point, uh, I'd already started setting up offshore, uh, an offshore company. And I was looking at, I was looking at the state of Europe, <clears throat> the UK and the West. And I was looking at really how we want to start maybe making some foreign investments rather than keeping all of our time, energy and investment within the UK. And so I was looking into that anyway. <clears throat> and we'd done that, we'd set up uh, a company and we set up a trust and I was in the process of setting up a foundation and then of course when Paraguay came up it just seemed like it was it was a fitting piece to maybe extend it in that direction as well so you know but that it's it's a long-haul task to set up 
companies, foreign bank accounts, especially when you're, you know, you're not, you're not citizens of that country. It's very difficult. It's an expensive, I, arduous task. I, I think it's a difficult thing for people to really understand. Um, having, you know, uh, people like myself that have lived in the UK all my life, you know, it, it's difficult to comprehend how you actually start setting up a life somewhere else and and how you actually you know even beyond even before you actually go somewhere it's kind of that process of like you know what is that catalyst that that made you go do you know what i'm up for doing that mm. I'm, I'm up for going somewhere else and i'm up for the challenge or the the adventure of moving somewhere like latin america mm. you know i mean that that in itself has got to be quite a um, I think it has to be a difficult decision or, it, or, or, you know, a brave decision, I think, as well. Yeah, it's usually, um, well, well, for me, I'll say what it was for me. It's usually a number of things, you know, so you might be, um, you know, you might be uh, not your, your, how can I put it? You're not content with the money you're earning in the country or maybe you're not content, should I say, not so much the money you're earning or the money you have to give away in tax in a certain country. Mm. You're not content with the way <clears throat> you're getting these top-down um, tyrannical um, rules in terms of uh, what you must have in healthcare, for instance, or what you must be seem to be having in healthcare and reporting and you know and and then how your how your bank is then sort of working against you rather than with you and there's all these little things so, so th this for you really kind of goes back to I, I guess the beginning of the covid era it does then, it, i think was it, was that the catalyst for you that well the thing is like so you might have you might have a, a multiple of reasons but then you'll have a trigger out of all of them and i think for a lot of people during that time of uh, if you came back to 2020 with the whole COVID debacle, um, it's a turning point for a lot of people. I think, or it, you know, it might have been the final nail in the coffin for a lot of people to say, you know what, a fucking enough is enough. I've had enough of this shit. You know, they are pushing me too far, and the thoughts and feelings I've had for a while about this, these, these criminals and and what they're doing. Um, and now it just kind of it's it's sort of galvanized it. Right. And so now I'm gonna actually do something about it. Because there's always talk everyone talks for years about whether they're gonna they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. They're oh. they're moan for for years. Oh, the end. the world's full of talkers, <laughs> but very few people very actually, few do, actually it. do it. And and very few people do it at a younger age. You yeah. know, you you're pretty young, really, for somebody that actually does this. I mean, most people um, and most people that I know that have taken the step to move, move abroad, you know, have done so um, when they're looking at retirement and it's yeah. been like, you know, I want to go and live in the sun now or my family is settled, you know, I want to or go. Or if they're in a corporation, if they're in a very well-paid job and this is why we're, we're going to give you a position overseas. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing, you know. That yeah. happens. Yeah, you know? but, but someone um, in the position you're in, you know, where you're running businesses in the UK, you mm -hmm. know, um, you're relatively settled. You've got family and friends and community around you. You know, actually, to um, and and a relatively young family as well. You know, mm. to actually say, right, you know, let, mm. let, let's go and have an adventure. You yeah, know, that, that's. Um, but yeah. I, but I do understand it. I mean, you know, obviously we've been friends for a while and we lived through the COVID era together. Mm. Um, you know, I I remember you know meeting around your house many times yeah. uh, during lockdown and having to smuggle ourselves <laughs> over the South Downs. Exactly. To, you know. Yeah. It, it yeah. was such a ridiculous Stasi time. police at the door. You know. Yeah. Banging know. at the door and questioning what we're doing and then trying to impose fake fines on us. Which also didn't get paid, you know? <laughs> and uh, and it, it was never gonna. You know, they got told it won't get paid. Fuck off! But no, look, I mean, it's ridiculous that you even have to have these conversations, you know. But it, it happened, and the thing is, it's like it's it's happened, and everyone it's it's like it dipped off, and everyone's in that in that lull, that sort of uh, that pause, quiet period where everyone sort of relaxes again. But they've already kind of done their they've done their saber rattling, yeah. They flex their muscles and they've tested the water with the world with how far they can push people and tested the reaction. And they've seen the reaction, they've measured it, mm. and now they're getting ready for their next move. And um, 
look, you know, for me, like I say, we we looked at Paraguay um, because really, like we said, pound for pound, you can go to many places on the planet and they are all behaving largely in the same way, um, with the exception of a few, uh, a few, let's say, developed countries. You know, you can take Sweden. They are, they are an example of how they handled that fake pandemic um they kind of carried on business as usual and statistically they did better than most you know but then so we have we have the likes of paraguay and really for me it it, it just really um it, oh, what's the word it just epitomizes um pure uh conservatism okay so, I, I, that that's not a term i would have ever thought of when I was thinking of, you know, a country like Paraguay. I mean, you know, my, my view of Latin America has always been sort of, I guess, jaded by, um, you know, cinema, really. I mean, mm. I, I remember back as a kid, you know, watching um, The Boys from Brazil, I think it was called, you know, where all the Nazi war criminals had sort of emigrated to South America to hide um, yeah. and they went down there chasing after them and, and trying to find them and stuff. Yeah. And, I, and I guess I always kind of looked at South America's kind of and, and the media pretty much portrayed it as this corrupt um, sort of, you know, uh, cartel driven um, sort of, you know, uh, lawlessness, I guess. Um, well, it, yeah, I mean, it is it is corrupt and the um, I mean, it, it becomes quite a deep subject this because when you analyse where money comes from, in my opinion, is ultimately is always corruption. Whether it's whether it's your household name, white collar corporate corruption, in bed with our Western politicians, <clears throat> whether that be um, tech companies or pharmaceutical companies or whatever, or or whether it whether it be other Ill illicit trade in uh, narcotics. Mm. And uh, Latin America is run by narcos, and that's where the money comes from, and that's what funds. Um, you know, political campaigns, it's normal. And it's not really something to be in shock over because it's nothing new. I Maybe that's also um, something that, that I've been trying to learn to come to terms with because there seems more of an honesty in the corruption, mm. you know, with, with the conversations we've had prior about sort of yeah. Latin America than perhaps we see in the um, in the West here. You know, mm. here we see our politicians handing out um, awards and, and business opportunities to their pals mm. and, and to their mates in Westminster and so on. But it's always, you know, uh, deals behind closed doors and it's always portrayed as in it doesn't happen and it's, yeah. um, you, you know what well, I mean? They're, well, they're, setting, they're setting rules for us while simultaneously not, not you know, obeying their own rules. Well, I mean, know, they, one, one rule for us, and they will literally rub our nose in it by by doing the fucking well, opposite. Well, they did that yeah. with COVID, didn't they? they I mean, did you know, COVID, you, yeah. you guys have got a lockdown. You yeah. gyms have got a lockdown. You can't yeah. be getting fit. You can't be going out and walking while yeah. they're partying away behind closed doors it's at, at down the street. It, you know? they're, they're, it's disgusting, and it really put a spotlight on them. But like you said, that's uh, that's with the upper echelon, isn't it? Whereas, like you say, in Latin America. It's uh, there's a base level of corruption that's very. It's a little bit more in your face. You know, you can if you've got the police or the caminera pulling you over, and they just want money. They just want money. So you're driving, you know, and and whether or not you've been speeding or not is irrelevant. Um, if you've got all your documentation in your car, they will keep finding and keep looking and looking for a problem with your car. And then when they when they don't find a problem, they they'll 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 just keep searching until you end up just paying them just so they piss off, you know. And it's this is normal. Or even if you have had a few drinks in your driving, and they pull you over and breathalyze you, um, they'll tell you, you know, well you've got to report to the uh, to the magistrate the next day and you're going to have to pay a £1,000 fine and all that. And so it's very much like, well, look, I'm going to pay you here and now so I can go. And he's like, okay, fair enough. So he gives you back your driving licence and off you drive home on your merrily way. And that's um, – so it's not 
it's not about safety, is it? It's not about road safety. It's so he can line his own pockets, bless him. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's the same with all the climate change agenda. You yeah. know, all this ULES scam. Yeah. It's not about clean air. No. It's about give us 20 quid and it's, you can travel around London all you want. It's about that. It's exactly yeah. the same. It's, it's just dressed to... up in a different way. You know, yeah. one's dressed up in this corporate bullshit where you re, you're hammered with these hard media campaigns and they put all their financial weight behind it. Whereas, you know, in these, what, what they consider poorer countries, it's it's a lot more, uh, you're not more in touch personally with that corruption. You know, um, it meets you on a personal level. Right. And, I, and pound for pound, I'll take that because I've got a bit more control over that corruption. So that that's, um, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, that, that that's something that is sort of, you negotiate a settlement. Yeah. And you do that there and then at the moment, you know, yeah. it isn't corporatized um, or, or uh, like, like you, Les, which is like, no, you have to pay this sum yeah. and, and that's it. Otherwise, you know, you, you get dragged through the or, legal yeah, system. Yeah, written into laws that you that you certainly yeah. never voted for a party that gave you a mandate over, you know. It's, you know, or, you know, or a, a bunch of corrupt globalist politicians that have signed you up to an agenda with the... With the uh, you know, with the WEF, that you were completely unaccountable, these people, you know. So it, it's, a, like I say, you've got more control over that. You're going you're gonna to face corruption wherever you go in the world. Absolutely. We're all going to have to interface with a bit of corruption. And uh, if you've still got a bit of control over your own destiny and you can sort of navigate your way around that corruption, then, I, like I say, I think I would take Latin America. But not... Um, not all the Latin America is the same, obviously. When I said about Paraguay being of pure conservatism, um, it is, but not not many countries around it are because because you've got the the neo socialists moving in and corrupting and rigging elections left, right, and centre well, in all these powerful countries around it. Well, we saw what happened in Brazil recently, didn't saw we? What so. happened in yeah, last October in Brazil with Bolsonaro? With uh, strangely, with um, computerized voting machines again. So, you see, I, th- 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 this is something where I I really do struggle with it because for me, and and this probably is a little bit contentious. I don't see a problem with computerized um, uh, polling machines because I think actually, if the data is transparent afterwards. You know, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be transparent. Then fraud can be detected. It's like blockchain. Mm. You know, if everything is transparent, mm. then it's auditable. Mm. What I have a problem with is them saying that okay, the machines have done the accounts, you know, and and they've worked out who the winner is. Yeah. But then nobody can audit the results. Exactly. And that those results are not available to the public and yeah. to people to go and audit for themselves. Exactly. That's what I have an issue with. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know. For me, I, I, it doesn't feel like it's the technology that's fault. Like with everything, it's not the technology; it's the mm. people that are using the technology that always seems to be the um, the aggravator, if you like. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, when did you um, when did you first go to Paraguay? Um, and and how did that transpire? It was uh, February twenty two. So February, yeah, February last year, we went there. And um, so we checked out this settlement that was um, uh, recommended to us. <clears throat> and we stayed there for a few months. It was, uh, so it's run by Europeans. So what, you, what you've basically got there in this uh, is called El, El Paraiso Verde, the green paradise. Um, it's not. It's green. And that's it. So what you what you've got is um, uh, the founders and the directors are uh, Austrian couple. Um, never really took to him in the first place, and my 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 main reason is I I kind of said with my family and friends at the time I was like, well look, there's there's things going on here, so we need to first of all we we can't form an opinion about a country without living and breathing in the country. Yeah, we've got we've got a really sort of you know. A, I need to go over there and get a feel for it for several months um, before we make a decision. Um, and so we so we went there with that intention and, and did exactly that. 
And really, the country, Paraguay, is, is fantastic. We we went over there because we'd already seen that we liked the constitution of Paraguay. Um, that that ticked all the boxes. The fact that it's it's a very conservative country. The the government generally, it's like going back in time, very old fashioned. They kind of leave you alone. The government asks nothing of you. They give you nothing. Well, that really is it, isn't it? You know, so you go there, you make your own way. If you work hard, you better yourself. You better your family. If each individual does that, you better your community. And communities grow on that principle. And, and, and that, to me, is is almost like a a utopian dream now. Hmm. Um, you know, I thought that's what we lived. But that but, is that but, is conservatism. You know, we, but we've, we've learned now that we're we, far from we it. haven't experienced conservat real conservatism in this country for well, certainly not in my lifetime. We have a Tory party, but they don't represent conservative values or principles. But you know, over over there, it literally is that. You know, you're not going to get a welfare state propping you up. Um, if you work hard, you get up every day and you graft and you better yourself and you make sound investments and you might make a few shit investments, you wear that, you know, but you then you pick yourself up and you just keep working. And those people that do that live well over there. They live comfortably. Uh, it's a very rural country. Um, over here, it's just a culture of if you don't want to work or better yourself, it doesn't matter, you're still going to get money. So and, and propped up by those who are working. And that's in it in essence, you know, it doesn't exist over there. And consequently, everyone's happier. You know, so every everyone's um because they've got a sense of purpose. They look healthier, they're slim, they're not on antidepressants, they're working hard, they've got a sense of purpose, and it makes them happy in their lives. Whereas what we have here is an epidemic of misery, oh, obese, overweight, overweight poor, people. Poor diet. Poor diet <laughs> yeah, poor on food. antidepressants. Yeah. It's yeah. either prescription drugs or, or, you know, or illegal drugs, and basically society's fucked. It, For want of a better word, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect anything less from you, to be honest. He's done it. <laughs> so, mm. I mean, I, I'm... <sighs> You know, I, I've got to go to Paraguay myself and experience this myself, I think, a little yeah. bit as well because, you know, we, we talk about it. But it, it's really difficult to picture a country where you have that level of freedom now because, you know, I mean, my own government criminalised me for going out for a walk and, and yeah. meeting my friends or trying to take my kids to the park, you yeah. know. And, and and with you talking about the sort of um, the happiness that people generally have over there. So are they, is that, is it wealth that's generating the happiness? Is it a sense of family? Is it a, a sense of belonging? You know, it, what, it's what classed you, as a poor, a poor country, like a third world country. And it's, it's not. And when you look at the, uh, the scale in which they measure third world, uh, you know, countries, it's actually, it's actually not, it doesn't fall into that bracket. Um, it, it's always hard because you think, well, how do they measure poor? Because actually, surprisingly, it's a fairly wealthy country. There's a lot of, there's plenty of money sloshing around in there. But as we know, we know the source of that money. Yeah. Where it ends up into other business and enterprise is another thing. And that, you know, that can sort of better and that can, that can create employment elsewhere. But we know, we know where the source of money comes from out there. Um, the infrastructure is not very good. So you've had, you have a country of low taxation. I mean, the tax there, the income tax is at the most 10%, at the most. Right. And that's across the board. It's across the board. So it doesn't matter what you earn, you, you don't get taxed more. It's not sort of incremental. Mm. The better you do, the more we hammer you. Yeah, I think VAT is about 2.5%. Certainly with the VAT on things I've been paying have been 2.5%. But I mean, a lot of, you know, it's a, they're not asking a lot of their people. They're not demanding a lot. So what is the cost of living like? Is it, you know, how does that compare? I mean, for instance, um, putting a roof over your head, you know, what does that cost you there? You can live over there, um, I'd say a family of four could live over there with rent and bills paid and food 
thousand to twelve hundred euros a month easily easily live quite comfortably very so, so, so it's you'd live comfortably it's a lot better than we have here. a lot of paraguayans would be earning obviously a lot less than that and getting by and still living comfortably yeah and and what are the paraguayans like as as a culture as a nation you know uh, as people to be spend time with i mean do you have many paraguayan friends loads yeah when we went out there i mean i've made my friends that i've made out there are more paraguayans than europeans i didn't go out there to make friends with europeans so obviously when i've got we've gone to that settlement which is a european settlement run by austrians it's a, a corrupt little shithole it's it's more of a a, a money making scam for them and we sort of looked at it and said well we don't want to get too heavily invested in that and so I, I actually simultaneously started investing in uh, um, land uh, in next to the capital city, Asuncion. So San Lorenzo, there's a place called uh, Pinedo, and uh, I started developing a house there um, because I, could, I just had a feel for this place being a, a bit of a rat hole. But we only really use it as a conduit to get in the country, uh, get ourselves familiarised with the, with the system, with the, the the migration process, they meant to help out with the uh, residency application, cedular application, which is your ID, and we and that was the main point of using. Them. And then it was a case of once we're there, we'll suss out and see if we want to live here within their settlement. And we didn't. It's just it, it didn't really cut it. Um, so God, there's so much to unpack with that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, if we start with the um the bureaucracy then so so what's the what's the bureaucracy like actually sort of wanting to go and live there are you, are you kind of welcome do they open their arms and let immigration in or do they have a tight border control you're, policy no you're welcomed um as a foreigner you would have to deposit I'll get this right in the region about three thousand dollars so you make your application for um permanent residency and off the back of that you would you would once once that's been granted then you can take that file and apply for your um id your national id which is your cedular and that would last for 10 years in the last two to three years the country has been inundated with uh applications for residency and Europe heavily, it's always been heavy with the Germans and the Austrians migrating over there. So it's taken a lot from Europe. It's taken a lot from uh, Canada, the US, a little bit from Britain. Um, but now in the past year, since what has been happening in Latin America, since what's happened in Brazil, which is like a, a continuation of what happened in Argentina the year before, mm which was a continuation of what happened in Venezuela in what 2015 and it's and all these all these uh, Latin American countries are just sort of slipping under this sort of yet another sort of wave of socialism and that, that, that's sort of taking over their infecting their their politicians because I mean Chile's sort of not good for that I mean Chile's in a bit of a mess what else can we name? Argentina. Um, and so what they're getting, and I've got a friend who's um, he's an estate agent in Asuncion, a Paraguayan lad, and he he just said, "I've Mike." He goes, "I've never seen it. I've never seen so many applications of uh, people interested in buying buying houses, uh, buying building plots within the capital. I've never sold so much." And I said, oh, what, Europeans? He went, not just Europeans, not anymore. He said, we're getting loads from Colombia, Venezuela. We're getting some down from Argentina. Brazilians coming in, Chile, Peru. It just goes on. He goes, we're just getting loads, getting mobbed. It's, it, it, it's so difficult to um, understand what's happening anywhere in the world these days because, yeah. you know, the, we're led to believe, I mean, looking at um, particularly the, the alt media, really, mm. we're looking at the American border and we're seeing the mass immigration from um, 
uh, down south, you know, from from supposedly Latin America, yeah. you know, immigrating into into America that you know, and they're talking about millions crossing that border. So I, I've kind of looked at that maybe naively and thought, well, why is all these men are leaving Latin America? I mean, is is it a wash it was with Mexicans women? Mexicans always complain about Mexicans uh, flooding the border. Mexican well, it, criminals. It, 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 it wasn't just Mexicans. You know, when I'm looking at it, they're sort of saying that people are coming up from Honduras, from mm. Colombia, from uh, Venezuela. You know, that they're, they're talking of them mm. sort of um, emptying the prisons and sending everybody up to America from there um, and from Brazil and stuff as well. So it, it seems like, but they all do seem to be, or, or the majority of them seem to be younger men that, that seem to be doing the immigration. The world is always sort of, Geographically and, and demographically, it's always shifted around constantly. It's always been fluid, isn't it? You know, it's just over. When you zoom out, there's always just been this constant movement and migration, mass migration. And I think what we're witnessing now, we're right in the middle of witnessing it here in Europe. Because I mean, Europe's always just changed shape, form, and um, and what it's been populated with, what continents have moved into it. And all you see now is um, we've got Africa and the Middle East pouring into Europe. Mm. We've got what's known as white flight, which is a real thing. Um, you only got to look at the demographics of our European cities and towns to, to know what's happening. But it's not it's not um, it's not isolated to Europe, is it? I mean, you look at Latin America and the same's happening over there. It's constantly moving and shifting. They're getting a lot poor into the top end of Latin America. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that's coming in to, for instance, into uh, Colombia and Venezuela, um, beckoned by a socialist regime in there. And then so there is one, there's really only one, I mean, Uruguay is pretty... Um, Uruguay is the next closest thing, I'd say, to Paraguay in terms of the way it's sort of governed and everything else. Um, it's quite popular, but there's only really Paraguay in the middle of Latin America that they're all looking at as a safe haven of low taxation, very strong economy, um, a very strong currency that's held its own. Um, and I think they're all kind of pouring in. And like you say, all so all. so it's a, it, it, it's a net. Immigration, really. Yeah, I mean, in, it, was, it was around uh, last year, 7 million as a population, um, God, approximately twice the size of, of the UK, thereabouts. I mean, what's the UK? I mean, we're told, we've been told for ages, about 60 million population. Of, I mean, I reckon we've got to be close to 70 million. I, I, I think you've got to be as well. Because, yeah. you know, and you're never going to know the true figure, but I would say a realistic stab would be 70 million. This tiny little island. I've told the Paraguayans that as well, you know, and I said, you know, you're you're twice the size of us and you're uh, one-tenth yeah, I mean, uh, one the population. Seven, seven like, million. What? I mean, London's bigger than that on right. its own, isn't it? You yeah, know? Exactly. And they all know each other. That's hilarious. They know each other from one end of the country to the other. They all see – obviously, social media's helped that. But it is funny when you – I've travelled to different towns and that, and I've, I've gone from one end of the country to the other, met different people in towns, and they, they know people from the town I've come from. It's so, bizarre. So you, you said the infrastructure is not so good. So, no. I mean, do people travel around much? You, you know, how are the roads? Oh, no, yeah, no, the you know, roads the, are fine. The networks and stuff over there. They're, 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 they're pouring money into the uh, the road networks there and in, in the rest of Latin America. It's more... Um, it's more in your in your towns that you pass through. Um, it's more things like pavements and knackered, if they even exist, you know, and and smaller sort of side roads and that. Main highways and that they're in better condition than ours, but probably because they're newer. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, our, our roads in the UK are in awful state right now. Yeah. I mean, we're we're suffering from a massive underinvestment in yeah. all of our infrastructure for a long yeah. time now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, it's 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 interesting when you talk about a country that's growing and that's investing in inf infrastructure. Yeah. Um, compared to a company, a, it, a country like ours that thinks we've got it all sorted, and actually we've got decades of lack of investment that is really starting to punish us. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It's starting to show the cracks are 
literally starting to show. It is like that. But they're investing in infrastructure here in the wrong things, the things that we don't want. You know, mass surveillance, they'll invest in that kind of infrastructure. Cam- yeah, yeah. Cameras everywhere. 5G, yeah, ab- 5G towers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all well, the shit you don't want. You know, well, well, the shit that we've got, they're pumping into the ocean and causing exactly. people to be sick. Yeah, you're driving yeah. across, you're driving yeah. through a road that's wrecking the suspension of your car because they won't fill potholes. Yeah. yeah, but there's a camera up at the corner to record your number plate. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, and again, you don't see that over there. You know, they don't. I've never seen a, a speed camera. I mean, you don't really see much CCTV. I mean, shops might have it if they personally want it to combat theft. But um, and on your roads, there's no CCTVs. There's no speed cameras. So, so that that comes back to another thing. So, so talking about the shops, then. So, um, can you buy everything you want over there? Yeah. Is is everything kind of as accessible as? as you would normally have in the UK? Is it like technology if you wanted to buy a new TV or computer? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, are, yeah, Are they similar prices to UK? Yeah, you just exchange your bongo drums and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is... It, you it's can, a bartering. You, you, I mean, we would joke about it, but but it, yeah. is there bartering? Is that... No, is that, no, 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 no. You just, yeah, you go in a shop and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing. There's this misconception. I mean, look, if you go in a Sonchen, um, they have uh, um, better shopping malls than what we have in most of the towns and cities over here. So they've got like three or four like large mega shopping malls uh, that would sort of rival the likes of our Westfield in London. That right, kind of okay. thing. They got everything. Yeah, got all the shops. They got everything. I mean, the smaller towns and that they have they have their um, electronic shops. They have their shops and things. It's not the quality isn't and, necessarily as. And good. are they are they like we're seeing in the UK now? Is it all chains, or or are they still independent local businesses? There? Um, it's both. It's both. They've got the smaller the town. Um. You've got so the chains have moved into the town. I'm just trying to think of the uh, the, the larger ones that you'll have out there. Inverfin would be one. It's like a shop that sells um, lots of electrical goods, but then they also branch out into they'll they sell furniture and beds as well. And at the front, they'll have a, a, an array of um, motorcycles. Okay, so, so they 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 cover a lot. So they're they're a big. They're a big brand, if you like. Well, they're big corporates. So they're, you've got an Inverfin in every town or Bristol, you know, those kind of ones. But, you know, you've got your mobile phone outlets. You've got your main. Um, is it is it full of tattoo parlors and nail bars um, and Turkish barbers? Uh, Paraguayan barbers, <laughs> which are, you can get a good one, you can get a bad one. Everyone's <laughs> so relaxed out there that it's just, everything's. Tranquilo, isn't it? Tranquilo. <laughs> is that what they call it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Just, so, I mean, that's 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 how they are. But yeah, I mean, you've got yeah, you've got nail bars. You've got you've got what you need out there. But it's not it's not pretty. You know, they don't have the what we're used to with um, European architecture. That sort of the shops and that are in, in, intermingled with, and we we'll mm. we'll have like a strict planning and con, uh, conservation. Thank God. Because you, when you go to places that don't have it, then you're actually glad of it, if you know what I mean. Because a lot of their towns, they don't look too good. And their pavements and the way the local authorities won't give a toss about how things are kept, you know, that can't, sometimes you want a little bit more but attention on isn't, that. Isn't that a double-edged sword? Because if you want that, then you've got to pay for it and... Therefore, you know, you've got to expect that you're going to get taxed more. Well, you got, you can pay local business rates, you know, out there, and the money should go to the right places to make sure that happens. I mean, some towns it does more than others. You can drive into towns where there's possibly less corruption and a bit more money flowing into the pot. And uh, some towns are certainly a lot nicer than others. Um, but if you really want the, the – it depends what you want. You see, if you want – authenticity if you want to go out there for paraguay then you wouldn't be moving into the um the city you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't go to assumption 
if if you just want authenticity, you you would because Asuncion is becoming more and more westernized. Because of like, the, like all main cities now, yeah, they yeah. become a, a yeah. hotbed of multiculturalism, don't yeah. they? So, so it'd, be, yeah. it'd be wise to move close to the city, maybe, but not in it. So then you've yeah. got everything you want. I mean, like good restaurants. We all, we all miss a good restaurant. If you, There's one thing you miss when you go out to some of these towns in Paraguay is the food, if they, they, their home-cooked food is all fresh and, and obviously their, their barbecues, it's all, it's all healthy fats, tons of meat. And you know, and and fresh organic food. But if you you can get a little bit bored with some of their food outlets because it's very much like burgers, chips, and pizza, whatever. It's the same same here, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but and exactly. And what do we all we all try and seek a good restaurant where you don't yep. always get that in in those towns. So you, sometimes yeah. you'll have to go to a really like a, you know an established town or a city to find a good restaurant. You know. And uh, I'd say they do exist out And when you find one. So is it is it sort of an agricultural country? I mean, mm. you know, presumably with so much land, yeah. you know, are they growing a lot of their own produce? Are they um, are, are they culling all the cows because of climate change? You know, are, are they under the same pressures that we are? No, absolutely not, no. Because they they see that as their, as their biggest output, you know, so... The wealthiest there are sensibly investing in uh, in cows and and farming. That's what they do out there. There there is an abundance of meat out there, so they export a lot of their meat. Uh, Argentina is known for having great beef, great steak. Yeah, yeah but they absolutely. buy a lot from Paraguay. So Paraguay really produces the most. Paraguay and Uruguay. So that's the, I think it's, I don't, I mean, don't quite remember, I, I think it's their biggest export. If it's not, I don't know what the, the number one is, but I would be well, surprised. I think probably already not. suggested what the number one is, but. but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't sampled but, that. But, <laughs> but subsequent to that, it'll be beef. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> well, actually, they don't produce that, but they do, uh, they do facilitate the movement of it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, um, what about money out there? So, um, do, when you get out there, do you do they take cash still? Are you um, are you actually going into the bank and and changing a lot of your money into what? What is it? Is it Guarani? Guarani, yeah, yeah. Um, or or is it all on the? Credit card, you know how how does that operate out there? Well, they they're happy for the cash out there. You know, you can you can you can walk around. You can pay for things in cash, um, like you can in most places, and it's it's not really. Well, you say you can in most places. I mean, you know, there's many well, shops now in the UK where not, you can't use yeah, cash. There's no it's there's no shop, upon. There's no shops out there where they where they refuse cash. Let's put it put it that way. I know what you mean. Like the the UK there. Uh, they're just trying to follow suit, aren't they? And trying to go completely cashless. But no, it's um, cash is okay out there. Um, but if you want to hold cash, you and you want to have a good spend up. I mean, you'd really need to hold a lot of cash because because let's just say you know I think um, it's a hundred hundred thousand guarani is twelve quid. You know. Oh gosh! And <laughs> <laughs> what denomination do the notes come in then? <laughs> did, you, did you get like a all the way down to twenty? No, sorry, all the way down to two thousand, two thousand notes, two thousand. Yeah, all the way up to see a hundred thousand. So you got a two thousand Guarani <laughs> note. Yeah. You'd feel like a millionaire when you go yeah. out. And yeah, yeah, basically grief. It's about what twenty twenty five pence. <laughs> <laughs> gosh, yeah. But it's no. So you, um, you 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 said earlier about the the bureaucracy, um, is heavily bureaucratic. Um, for things like, I mean, everything like in a lot of these countries, uh, everything's notarized. They want to get everything. You have to have a public notary, an mm. official, to sign and rubber stamp everything. And so, buying a car. For instance, is uh, 
it's a lengthy, tedious process. The paperwork that's involved, back and forth, back and forth, and different officials. So here. You can't. You can't just go into a car supermarket and say, "I'll take that one and sort of drive and, it away." Drive out. And and then you know with the logbook exchange and then that's it done no because you see over here we we think it's we think it's good but then again you, your logbook is only really just sort of recording your registered keeper there's no proof of ownership in fact it's not always that easy to determine proof of ownership whereas over there for all the 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 bureaucracy does get in the way and it can be tedious with a lot of things because a lot isn't also digitalized. It's still like that, you know, you don't have a lot of electronic documents. It's it's still reams of paper, hand signatures and stamping that that <clears throat> that sort of um makes it makes it official what you've got, you know. And it's like I say, it's going it's like going back decades. Yeah, isn't it? But you can prove ownership that I actually own that for, through this process. And it's a, and it's a lot more black and white than what we have over here. Yeah. 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 No, I understand that. So while it can piss you off and waste your time, in some things it really is a piss off. But in other times, it's it's you can prove you can prove a trail of ownership quite easily, and it can't really be disputed, nor more importantly taken off of you. You can't just have some authority come and take that. It's it's mine. You know, I'm not doing that. So. Mm. It's, it's it's really interesting, and it does sound like um, it, it it does sound a little bit like life when I was a child, mm. you know. Um, yeah. You know, there, there was certainly a lot more sort of paper driven, and and people owned things, and um, yeah. I mean, I you know, we we know that the way the world is going, you know, and and we're moving towards this tokenized world where everything's going to be sort of enshrined um, in the blockchain, you yeah. know. So that that's another thing because. You know, sort of broadly interested in crypto, and I know you've got some interest in crypto as well. Mm. Is that I I know there's strong development communities in Latin America. I know with currency problems they've had in the past, they kind of embrace crypto in more. Is is that something that you're able to spend over there? Is that accepted? Or yeah, yeah, you can. Is, um, and it's that's a good question as well because like if you look at El Salvador as we know, and how that um, how that sort of took on Bitcoin, didn't it, as, uh, as mm. a legal tender in, in their country and why they did it. And the, uh, the fact that their president was, he's only a young guy and he's quite a visionary. That started off as a bit of a, a British mess around project. It's, it was almost like a bit of an experiment of introducing Bitcoin into a really really poor community in El Salvador. And the reason why the president got behind it and the reason why it took off is because so many people in El Salvador don't have bank accounts. So they had no real means often of accessing money when they needed to. So uh, there was a handful of Brits. This is my understanding of it. Don't quote me, but I, I watched something on this. There's a handful of Brits that went over there and they introduced, just as an experiment, Bitcoin into a community and it just exploded exponentially to the point we're at now where, what was it, 18 months ago or whenever it was, nearly two years ago, that El Salvador um, announced that they they, they they have it. It runs alongside the US dollar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which has put the Americans or the, the Fed's nose right out of joint. Yeah. Well, I, and I then know, so now they start threatening. Well, I, I know a... Um, not just Bitcoin, but I know a lot of Latin America like the stable, the USDT. Yeah, you know they, they like the stable dollar. Well, it's um, so it's so nicely well, tradable, but, isn't it? Yeah. And and also they don't have to have dollar notes, no. you know. But they can still. I, I I guess it kind of stems back to in Argentina and Venezuela and stuff when they've had their currency currency yeah. debased as much as they have done. Yeah. Um. You know. You, you know. I they mean, welcome it. Yeah. They yeah, welcome. yeah, and you can understand it. In these you? countries, they don't like the constant uh, threat and pressure from the US, with threatening them with their access to their dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, um, before I, I've only really just managed to obtain a bank account in Paraguay, and that that was painfully, painfully slow. 
It's so after to... what two years, you've got you've only just got a bank account. Of an of a, no. Uh, okay, so you have to have obviously yes, yeah, kind of yeah, because you have to have um, a cedula, and mine yep. and mine was a delayed process even with that. It's another story, but um, finally got the cedula. But then, as a, as a foreigner, um, I I don't have any I don't have any sort of uh, registered active income over there. I don't have what is called a, a rook number, which is basically your your tax ID number. I don't have one right. because I haven't at this moment opted into the tax system over there, so, and I don't think I particularly want to. But I may do. I don't know. So, with the absence of that getting a bank account although i'm a resident or i've got the cedula they're still looking at me as a as a gringo and they're going to look at me with suspicion and i'm a foreigner so it's not easy for me to get a bank account and uh oh you know i mean i did manage to get one and it's now open and i'm, I'm actually transacting into that bank account it took me about five right. weeks of an application um from start to finish right still a long time Five weeks, it should really be quite straightforward to, can I, <laughs> am I opening yeah. this bank account or not? I've answered all your questions. I think I must have answered about 200 more questions before they finally gave Good me grief. a bank account. But, but, but I know you were looking at it before. So, yeah. Um, and I guess it's it's just having all of this paperwork in place. Yeah. You've got to go through the rigmarole of that bureaucracy yeah. before you can even apply to have a bank be- account. Because it's, it's a money laundering capital of the world it's one of you know it's it's is it well apparently so because because of the narcos because of where it is because of you know you've got paraguayan banks but you've got other banks that are positioned over there which are brazilian banks and argentinian banks and um you know the area in which it's in uh southern america middle america you know, it's cartel country, isn't it? It's cartel land. So, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the banks have been abused over there. And be- because of the, the readiness and availability of land, mm. it's a good place to park up your money if you want to do some heavy laundry. Yeah? Right, okay. So I was probably uh, treated with suspicion. But it, it was this English, what's this English geezer want with a bank over here? You know, it just went on forever. But but surely with so many um, Europeans sort of emigrating over there, I would have thought that process would have become easier. Um, but the it, it, yes, it does. But then by then the protocols that have been extended within the bank's compliance teams, like the compliance divisions, now they're sort of they're being ramped up with what they have to ask. Then they can't then. Um, they can't then, uh, what's the word? Um, they can't have one rule for you and not, not another. They just have to, it's right across the board now. It's just stringent questionnaire. Right. That's it. So, um, but in terms of like crypto and Bitcoin, um, you know, I've at times where I've been over there and although, you know, you can use your own bank over there, you're just paying fees, you know, so I've got my own yeah. bank card and, you know, I can draw money out, but. It's you, you're paying, you're paying just makes it more charge. expensive to do it, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you're just quite limited because sometimes you might want a lot of money if you want to make a purchase. For instance, I mean, I went out there, I had uh, through one of my companies sold, I think it was in that it would have been last year, around about May, when there was a big nosedive in crypto and there's a crash, you know. So I'd sold, I bought back in, I'd made a bit of a profit. And so I went and bought a car. But I needed, I wanted to go and buy it. The deal I got on that car was a cash deal. So I could have either had it for X amount uh, on on credit or I could get it for, for X amount if I was going to buy it for cash. And so I didn't have any cash. So I went and I knew how much crypto I had. About USDT. I knew how much mm. of that I had um, kicking around. So... I went to an exchange. It was a walking exchange in in the capital in Asuncion. A walking exchange, crypto exchange, where they where you can pay your crypto over. Obviously, there's a fee, there's an exchange fee, and I walked out with cash. And I went and bought a car. 
See that that doesn't exist for, over here. That, that, that for a lot of <laughs> for a lot of us living in the West is yeah. like uh, what? <laughs> uh, apparently, apparently Paraguay is a third world backward country. Yeah, apparently isn't isn't that bizarre? What's backwards? Yeah. Isn't that bizarre? And yet, so so on one side of it, we think they're a long way behind us. Yep. And on the other side of it, they're doing things that we could only dream of today. Very advanced. Very advanced. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that leads me on to another thing. So you walk out of there with a whole load of cash. Yeah. How safe are you? I mean, is what, what you know, you said it's a, a country that, that you know, that there's a strong sort of narco presence and stuff over there. I mean, do you feel safe over there? Is it, you 100%. know? I feel safer over there than what I do here. And I'm not just saying that for the benefit of this recorded interview. I say I feel safer over there, and I'll say that to anyone. Because you've only got to look at the, the crime statistics over there. Violent crime, for instance, you know, and attacks on people. If you are mixed up in... um if you're mixed up in that business of being in, in narcos, uh, drug wars and drug trade and everything else, yeah, you can expect maybe you might get a bullet in the head, you know, if if that's your line of work. But I'm not, and I don't know anyone else over there that is, so there's no problem or threat. You know, narcos aren't going around um, shooting people indiscriminately. In fact... You know that wouldn't be good for their business. But, no, no, I'm sure. But but how do you how do you fit you you know how do you feel as like a stranger in a foreign land? Do you? Do you... I was welcomed. I was very welcomed. They're not they're not aggressive people. Um, in fact, I'd go as far as to say you know us us Europeans are probably a lot more leery and violent than what they are. Um, a lot of the crime that has been carried out before over there has been from Europeans, mostly Germans. Um, whether it be fraudulent or, or violent or violent crime. Um, the, you get, you get um, house robberies over there. Of course it happens. Most of the crime that's committed over there is not by Paraguayans. It's by um, Brazilians or maybe Argentinians that have hopped over the border and committed some crimes. Right. That happens over there. Um, but when you compare it pound for pound and statistically with our sort of violent crime and armed house robberies and that that we have over here, it's not even close. From a country of, you know, um, that, that's supposedly full of um, armed criminals, well, we've got armed criminals here. So and Plenty of them. Um, <laughs> just because they, just yeah, they no, banned yeah, guns, it yeah. doesn't mean guns aren't in operation over here. <laughs> no, you know, that's very true. I have a gun over there. But I, it's licensed, and the thing is, if you the, the the beauty of it over there, you can protect your property with your gun, and it, you're within your right to do it. So if you've got someone that comes into your property over there, uninvited, causing problem, threatening you, you can shoot them, and the you the, the law would back you. If someone's threatening you and your family, you can shoot them, and even if you shoot them dead, the the law is on your side because. As long as you can demonstrate there's been reasonable force used and they've come in armed or whatever, and you can do that, you can't do that here. No, I mean self defence in the UK is something that is questionable now. Yeah. So, so I when I when I went to because I wanted to go over there because, um, I wanted to have that ability to protect my my house over there. You could say I would be uh, as a European, I might be a beacon. They might. You might get uh, if you if there are any criminal groups over there, they might think, well, we would target him. He's European. He must have money. So yep. you'd want to be able to protect your property and yourself and your family. So I, I, uh, I got a gun, and um, and is that is that easy? Can yeah, can really, anybody get a gun over there? If you've got, a- you got a cedula, and you can, um, if you don't have a police record, you've got a cedula and. It's a case of yeah. As long as it, as long as you register the gun, yeah, yeah. So it's that's a illegal they ownership. They don't, they yeah. don't, they want, they want it like the Wild West, where they can't sort of, you know, trace a crime. Hmm. If I use that gun in a crime, it'd be traced back to me. So they, you know, it's not, it's not lawless over there. But they said we can have a gun as long as you we <laughs> and it, trust you to be responsible with, with it. it. And and when I got it, you know, and I was buying it in the shop, 
you know, and I, there was obviously other things like within a shop that is like, it's like a treasure, you know, you're in there and you're like, wow, there's all these things and uh, things you want to buy in there, other little bits of weaponry and that, and cans of pepper spray, you know, mace and all that. Um, I, I said to him, you see that there? I said, we can carry that in the car. We don't need a, a license for that. He went, no, this is a guy who's selling it to me, Paraguayan. He went, no, of course you don't. I said, see, in the UK, I said, if my wife or daughter was carrying that can of pepper spray in her bag yep. and she was attacked, yep. uh, physically attacked, if she pulled that out, and let's say she's attacked by a man, you yep. know, and he's pinning in a, if she pulled that out and sprayed that in his face, um, she would also be arrested and charged for having that in her possession. Yeah, yeah. she'd be he, committing a crime. She'd be committing a crime for defending herself with that pepper spray. And the guy looked at me like I was like I was on crack. Like he just he just like what? Didn't believe me. He said, "We give that away free when you make gun <laughs> when you make gun <laughs> you purchases. You gun free charge. Yeah, you can have that in your car. Of course you can. <laughs> of course you can. Why wouldn't you? So and and so so you, you have a gun over there. Is it something you can carry with you? Is it sort of concealed carry? No. Is it open carry? Is it no? Mine is. is uh, the, it can't leave my house. It can't leave the 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 grounds of my of my home. That's what my license says. So you can have as many guns as you like in your house. Um, you have to apply for a separate license if you want a one to carry. You can, okay. you can have it, um, but you have to go through slightly more, uh, a few more checks. And you can only have, so for every gun you have in your house, you have to have a license for that gun. You can't have a, a broad license for a collection of guns. You have to one license for every gun. You right. Have. Okay. Um, if you want to have um, one to carry, I think you the, the maximum you can have is three. You can carry three. Carry three. <laughs> yeah. Like. <laughs> so you can't go around like a one man army and 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 rob a place. <laughs> <laughs> and is it? Are, are you just talking about pistols, rifles, automatics? You know what what. You, uh, what, what are they class as guns Sets, over there? Yeah, they're they're pistols. Yeah, pistols. semi-automatic pistols. So like a Smith and Western or something. You know, yeah, yeah. Block yeah. or yeah. You're not gonna. You can't really go in with. Um, it's, so it's not like the US. No, it's, you you haven't yeah. got an AK-47 that you're walking around with. You can't carry. You can't carry a machine gun over there. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> obviously i mean if you if your job is a guard you've got different different licenses again you know and everywhere's guarded you know banks are heavily guarded are they heavily guarded there's, there's, there's a real presence of so um so like bank robbery is still a thing over there then well is bank it? robbery is not a thing because well, it was. it's so heavily guarded right okay so it's a massive deterrent um i mean everywhere has an armed guard but the acts as a deterrent and it and it kind of works, so it's like, well, what's the point in trying to even attempt to rob that place? They, they, We're not going to win. They have security guards on my local co-op now, because the kids were going in and looting the shop, and you know, mm. you you go down in the evening, mm. um, and the kids would be running into the shop, and they'd just be helping themselves to anything they want and and leaving the shop, and it was just lawlessness. Mm. And and so you know, a local small co-op now mm. has security on the door, but. The security is also is, is also still like a dog with no teeth. Oh yeah, it's it's because, unarmed and they can't because really... they can't. They're not allowed to apprehend. They're not allowed all, to do all these different things. All all they do is stop them entering. No. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And but the and this is the problem with over here. You know, it's it is it is antisocial over here to the point of anarchy a lot of the time because people can do whatever they want. There isn't a deterrent. Over there, people are not gonna go and people don't rob shops over there. You just don't you just don't see it, you don't hear of it, you don't see antisocial behaviour. This is a really important point. You don't see any antisocial behaviour. You don't see people drunk in the street fighting, shouting and screaming, gobbing off. Homelessness. The homelessness, yes. Yep, you see homelessness. More so in uh, in the in the bigger towns in the cities, you'll see homelessness. Um more than here? No. No. Probably about the I same. Mean, I mean, homelessness here in the UK, you know, as you know, it, it, it's something that's ballooned in recent years. It has, you know, yeah. it, it used to be such a rare thing. 
Mm. Um, you, you saw it, but it, but it was rare, you know, mm. but it's ballooned so much. And it's not immigration that seems to be the homeless problem. You know, most of the immigrants that are coming in are being put up in hotels and are being given accommodation. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's... It's I think, yeah, definitely an issue that we have. They're coming as a from a certain now. route. They they are they're getting in, and it's almost like if they come from from a certain route, a certain path in, and almost like from a certain nationality, they're being welcomed in with op- open arms, as you say, put up in four star hotels, a goodie bag waiting for them on a on a warm cozy coach to take them there. Hmm. But a lot of um, a lot of homelessness here is a mixed bag. Like you say, you see a lot of you see a lot of Brits, a lot of white Brits, a lot of veterans. But I, you also see a lot of Romanians. Yeah, depending on where you go, I see a lot of Romanians. Say in London, in the West End, there's a lot of them that have just flooded over here in maybe the last I don't know like ten years or whatever, and they will be lining the streets. I've seen it in uh, Oxford Street. So these are EU immigrants. EU immigrants that yeah. came across. Yeah, that are sleeping on the street. Yeah, it could be Romanian gypsies or whatever, and they're giving birth on the pavement. Whereas non-EU immigrants are coming into the UK, are all being housed and accommodated. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting perspective when you <laughs> when you wonder what they're doing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it 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 it's a bizarre thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's very, very bizarre. Whereas, you know, when you talk about immigration into Paraguay, you're talking about immigration that's actually bringing money into the country. Yeah. And and are these monthly retirees that are going there or are they people that are starting businesses? No, all, or, all ages uh, now, all ages. All, 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 you know, you're, you're, well, yeah, just literally all ages. Because like you say, you've got, you've got those with a little bit more money that have... Um, maybe business owners or whatever in Colombia that are sick of what's happened to their, their country and the inflation that they're witnessing over there. And they're, they're packing up their families and they're going to places like Paraguay or and, those from Chile. And, and, and I guess for them, it's easier because they've got the language. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. That, that's kind of a, an easy move, isn't it? I would guess around Latin America. Very exactly. Yeah. But like, but I, th- Anyone that migrates into Paraguay can go there, and they can better the country, and and that's all. All you really we, they don't have economic migrants going in. They don't have people going in there with no pot to piss in. You know, but anyone that goes there that I've witnessed, and when I see the migration center now, from when I when I first saw that migration center, it was fairly busy. If you go in the, there's one little center basically for migration there, and now they can't cope. They cannot really? cope. They're inundated. Yeah, yeah. But you don't get economic migrants going there because it's not a country to go to if you have nothing. They're not going to give you. They, anything. There's no support for you if you. Yeah. If you do, they don't want it. <laughs> They're yeah. not going to give you yeah. anything. So you don't open it up. Exactly. Yeah. So they don't have a problem with that. So Pretty simple. As as a gringo going there, then mm. is there much opportunity for you? Are, are you looking at it and going, hell, I, I can, you know, yeah. As an entrepreneur, as a, as a as a businessman, I can see opportunities here. There is because all the, all the businesses that say that you know we may have all considered at one time or another investing in in our lives, but probably wouldn't do it now because of the way the EU have behaved, because of the way the the, the British government behave now with behave now with policy or uh, green policy that gets in the way of it, or even just you know what what you have to the the hurdles you've got to sort of jump over just to achieve certification and stuff and and it's just it's just nonsense and like um over there they just welcome you with open arms it's like like I say it's like going back in time if you want to invest in farming and cows if you've got the money and you've got the, a good business plan together it's not so easy to start a company over there. Again, because the bureaucracy it, kicks in again, it can take many, many months. I was going to say, if it takes five weeks to open a bank account, then starting a business. <laughs> yeah, like, like over over here, I could I can open a limited company and bank account attached to it inside twenty minutes. Yep, on the phone, um, and there you go. I'm a director of a company over there. It just takes many months. 
But once it's done and you've got your company set up, the easy part is setting up a business and just investing, you know, because again, you don't have, you've got past the red tape of opening a company. Investing over there, they they welcome investment. That's so, the so they're welcoming investment in an old fashioned projects. You so, know? so what are what are all the immigrants doing? So you you said there's a lot of European immigrants, there's um, Germans and Austrian and Brits and and also people coming from America as well. What are they What are they doing when they get there? What 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 What's their lifestyle like? You know, what are they investing in? What what well, uh, what businesses are they starting? A lot will come with money, so they can take an early retirement because they can buy land or property outright and then live very cheaply and not, you know, a lot of them have their own online businesses where they can be anywhere in the world and still earn money. So that's, that's quite normal. Um, so they can have like a, a passive income whilst having, they own their property outright and they can live quite comfortably without having to bust a gut. Others come there with a bit more ambition and they want to invest in farming and in cows. You can invest in, um, you can open up restaurants there, but I think I think you'd be better off in the city doing that. Um, so most come for a semi-retirement, I'd say. Yeah. A semi-retirement. I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. 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 It, it seems to be a sort of, you know, I can go there and have a much more affordable lifestyle much mm. more cheaply and therefore I can potentially retire a lot earlier than I would have done in the West. It, exactly. You can own you can go and you can go and purchase land, you can go and develop several houses and then you can rent those houses out. So, and you and if you a lot what the, a lot of the Germans do, they'll do that within they, they they like to sort of create their little communities and settlements. And they will do that and they will um position their own little restaurants within those settlements so i mean they their restaurants might do okay that's that's the germans but i mean by and large most most people that go out there can retire um cannabis would also be a good one out there you know if you is that legal yeah you can have a a, a license to to grow cannabis um you can produce that out there you can produce that out there and obviously for a for a, a medicinal purpose and and what is the climate like out there for for growing stuff and what have you i mean is it um well the cannabis you know, farms apparently from, from what i can hear in the sort of san pedro region they thrive i mean it's a really humid climate um but it's hot um yeah i mean it, it works it works for you, you you can cultivate out there you can cultivate cannabis um you can you can set the climate anyway with that you know you can adjust that to make it work yeah but but but, but, but the main point is you can get a license to do it but the the climate you find out there is it you know is it hot all the time is it uh it does it rain a lot you know what, what what's well it's it's obviously it's seasonal but i think what i find it's like two-thirds of the time it's it's hot weather and then of, of that two thirds, you'll have hot going into really hot. A third of their time, yeah, it's it. You'll you'll have um, you'll have a cooler period, and then you'll have I suppose that what they will call a really cold period might be between six and twelve degrees. It's really, 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 really cold. cold then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really cold. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to last for very long. Not really. Yeah. It doesn't seem to last long. So it seems it feels like short winters. Yeah. And then... Most of the time that might hover between 12 and 15, but they can drop. They can drop down. But when it's hot, it's hot. You know, it's hot. When it's when it's super hot, it's hitting 40. But it's, so it's humid with the heat as humid. well. So you, do you get a lot of rain? Is rain yeah, and when it big over there? When it, I suppose their weather's extreme when it's hot. It's really hot. When you get rain, you know you, you're getting rain. It's it's really um, torrential. You're in the jungle, aren't you? You know, you are in the jungle out there, right? You know, and you yeah. you're always reminded of that. Although it's civilized, but you can't ever get away from the fact that the insects are constantly reminding you that you're on our 
you're on our territory just because you built a house here, you know. They're always there to remind you and, uh, yeah, the climate does as well. You're in a jungle. So wildlife then, what, what do you what do you have to tolerate with wildlife-wise? Well, the worst part, um, because you don't really come across dangerous snakes and dangerous spiders. I mean, I think they've got, they've got some, but it's tarantulas they have, but it's no big deal. You might see one a month, maybe. Um, see, I, I always wanted like, a pet tarantula, but yeah. the, the missus had said it's it's me or the spider. <laughs> for, for me, well, you can have mine. <laughs> that way. Uh, um, I, it wouldn't bother me is what I'm saying. I, I you know, I, um, I, 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 I don't mind spiders because they get rid of the flying insects. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, tarantulas are quite. You know, they're not aggressive spiders, are they? You know, I no, mean, they, they, they're pretty docile. They're docile. Spiders go. They're more frightened of us. They don't yeah. generally attack. There is uh, two native snakes, and there's one that's a lot worse than the other. That I think they're, they're venomous, and uh, that apparently can. I don't know how common it is, but that one will go for you. That's all I know, really. But the worst thing is the mosquitoes. That's, yeah. It's the mosquitoes because the humid, the humidity. So, and it's the most irrigated planet on Earth. So I was going to say, so with all the water. rain, it's, there's a lot of standing water, is there? Yeah, yeah. It is, it, there's so much water there. It is a landlocked country, but it is. it sits on its own natural reservoir. So there's so much water. So there's... No shortage of water. No, no sh- so so yeah. is it good drinking water? Good drinking water. The country is largely hydro powered. Oh, really? The electricity and so is it ab- abundant electricity? That's abundant. Not- it, the the country uses one fifth of the electricity it can produce. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's a real net exporter of electricity as well. Yeah, yeah. Which is why it's uh, it's a popular destination for mining. For, okay. crypto, for crypto mining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it would be a lot cheaper, wouldn't it? So. Yeah, 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 the electricity is cheap, power is cheap out there. Well, may, may, maybe that's something that maybe we should explore then. Yeah. You know, yeah. A, a crypto mining operation out there. I looked, I looked that, into it. I looked, yeah, I looked, it's very hard. It's very hard yeah. to make money at it nowadays. I did look into that. Well, you, first you just need Bitcoin to rise a little bit first. You need you a say? bit of that. But, but to achieve that last... Um, yeah. Block. It's you know if you've got a small mining operation, I, I don't really. I think you'd need to have a huge mining operation really to, to make it worthwhile financially. And and there's a lot of investment that need to go into that. But I mean, we looked at that because you can buy ready-made sort of shipping containers that have been converted into <clears throat> mining bins, you know, and they are kitted out well. But you know, you've got to have so many of these sort of machines in there yeah so um, it's a lot of upfront investment yeah. to do that and yeah with a limited lifespan so. yeah i don't know enough about it but what i know enough about it to know that i don't think it's going to earn me enough money quickly yeah. enough you know so yeah. i'd probably i'd probably go for i'm interested in crypto as you know so i'll i'll continue to invest in crypto but if i'm investing out there i'd invest in traditional businesses which we're deterred from investing in over here in the in the West. Yeah, I mean, no one, no one in the West wants to be a farmer now. No, do that. I mean, no. farmers are under attack. They've left, been right, bullied and out of it. Yeah, you know, it's disgusting. Whereas over there, it's not. It's the opposite. I mean, it's it's quite the opposite. You know, we should all be supporting our farmers. We should actually be looking after our local farmers. I mean, we we do. We we buy all our milk and we buy raw meat from local farmers. Yeah. We get eggs from local farms. We we try and source meat from local farmers when we get an opportunity to. Um, not as frequently as we'd like to, but you know, I, I think everybody needs to be making a big effort to support the local farmers. Yeah, I'm fully on board with that. So it's really interesting when you talk about a country where farming is one of the main industries in the country. Yep, it is, and um, you know they're not they're not continuously being sprayed. I mean, here's an example when when we look at. Um, when we look at uh, uh, the, what what we buy in in sort of meat that's full of hormones and and everything that mm. we, the problems we have over here, like in in Uruguay, for instance, the government banned that. You cannot you cannot sort of 
you can't sell that. You can't do that kind of farming over there. So that that's not allowed. So so, is it organics? I mean, do they market it as organic, or is it just sort of natural product? Yeah, it's 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 fully non-GMO, um, and you can do that in Paraguay, but most opt not to to, to not do that. They, I, I don't think I know any farmers over there, and you you can tell the the difference in the quality of the meat. So there's a lot of non-GMO. And like I say, in Uruguay, it's it's been outlawed. They're not they're not allowed to do that. It's the only country I know that do that. You know, wow! They export a lot of their beef, so it's good quality beef that you get out there. Yeah. So maybe that's another opportunity, actually, exporting beef back to the UK. Because you know, I mean, in the UK, in in Europe and Ireland, you know, they're talking about culling thousands of cattle in order to meet bloody climate change. Whereas all, all they're actually doing is giving more opportunity to places like Latin America. So maybe maybe that's maybe that's a good opportunity. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. I, I, what world do we live in? I, I know. know. I know. I know. It, it's beyond belief, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. I mean, yeah, it's great for business out there, but quite frankly, and you know, and, the UK and is the, our home country, and, and all the cattle naturally grass fed generally, or yeah, b- because of the volume of land, that volume you've got. of land. Yeah, they got they just got sort of. Hectares and hectares of it out there, yeah, an abundance. So, um, yeah, and and you know, from from my understanding with it, and 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 speaking to scientists, uh, sort of have a lot of expertise in that area. You know, grass fed cattle are actually very green anyway. Yeah, you know, it, it's only the diet that we feed animals with, um, with this sort of unnatural grains and stuff that we feed them that yeah. causes the methane anyway. If we yeah. actually let them graze naturally and 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 work the way that their systems are designed to work, we would, you know, it wouldn't be an issue. Not that it is the cow size fart, of the issue that we're told farts anyway. Were never an issue for thousands and thousands of years, and suddenly cow farts have become an issue. I know, I know. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's amazing what people it, believe. It's shocking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's absolutely <laughs> shocking. <laughs> so, um, I I guess then, um. You you kind of come across as pretty positive on Paraguay mm. as as an option, mm. providing you you know that some caveats are kind of steering away from anything that's kind of organised. So, I mean, how how would you get into Paraguay without going through this sort of pre organised route? Is that is that achievable? Um, we can get in, but you'll be on a three month visa. So you know, but but then you know, going through the rigmarole of actually getting a permanent residency, getting a cedula, all of that. You know, you you said you did that through the sort of the yeah. PV route, yeah. And, so, and so, they helped with that process, yeah. But they actually, but all they did was deliberately hinder it because I mean you know, that that's that's what they are. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend that organization uh, at all. They they they're terrible, and. Um, I think they're just sort of disbanding now anyway because it's, they had such a European interest and now um, there's been so many lawsuits against them for fraud and illicit practice and money laundering, theft. It just goes on and on. It's not something that we've generally seen in the media over here. I, kn- no. I know there was a period where uh, the UK press were attacking EPV mm. Mm. And, and sort of joking about people looking at Paraguay and well, stuff. But so, so, what, so the mainstream media will always sort of look at places like that and it's it's a, an easy, lazy headline just to say, well, they're conspiracy theorists, they're anti-mask, they're anti-vaxxers. And that was always their main headline. Fr- freedom lovers, really. Freedom lovers. And, of course, all that actually did was give, give strength to the likes of EPV. EPV because there's lots of Europeans that would then pick up on that, have absolute distrust for the uh, mainstream press, so then they would flock to EPV. Now EPV aren't good, but not for those reasons. They're 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 not good because um, uh, they were making promises that were false, basically. I mean, I've actually had um, a journalist from from the BBC contacted me two weeks ago, wanting to do a full interview on it. But I said to him, look, if I do that, I don't want 
you to start going on and staying about them being anti-vax. So, because, because what is your agenda behind this interview? What, what, what are you hoping for an outcome? Yeah. Because yeah. If, it's, if it's just about to try and continue, continue to, to paint. To attack the community the, that. The, the, yeah, to, the, the, the community they're in are great people. And so if you're going to try and attack them as being anti-vaxxers, anti this, anti that, you know, anti stab it's, you know, and, and the people that go to Paraguay are by default these sort of nutters, then I don't want any any part of your interview, you know. So if you want a, a genuine sort of um, synopsis on EPV, I can give it to you. That's, that's yeah, fine. Then, then you don't want to be talking to the BBC. No, <laughs> I not think, really. I think everybody knows that they're, they're the bias corporation now, aren't they? Well, he, act, he actually approached but, me saying, you know, I, 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 I can appreciate you, you probably have um, uh, doubts about speaking with the BBC. They're so used to it now. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's changed so much. I mean, we used to look at the BBC as being the pinnacle of journalism and the, the, the pinnacle of um, unbiased, worldwide, trusted yeah. news. And, and now, you know... I've been exposed uh, for what they are. Yeah. and and Because it, it's anything but old, old auntie. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's horrible, but yeah. So I mean, they know the BBC know what they are, and they know they're not trusted. So now they're when they approach people for stories, they're like a cat on a hot tin roof, you know. So anyway, I I don't think I'm going to give him much time because I don't think there's much to do there. But um, we were saying earlier about getting into Paraguay, what you've got to do, what you what you don't do. Mm. Um, it was up until I think, say, a, nearly a year ago now. Some point last year, up until then, it was uh, when you make that application for your permanent residency and you get your cedula. Your cedula would last for ten years. Now they've dropped that to I think it's three years because they are Gosh, so inundated on applications. Big change, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So if you you go there now, you can apply for your residency, get your cedula. That lasts for three years. So I think they've dropped the, the the necessity to deposit the three grand into the bank, though, because you had to deposit the three thousand dollars into the um, it's like a deposit mm. into the national bank whilst that application process is done, and then when you get your residency and your cedula, you can go and retrieve that money, and, right, and do what you want with it then. So it's but, only a deposit. Yeah, but I, I would imagine that's quite a deterrent to only get three years on a cedula because it's like, how do you invest into a country where you know that because it, it, when you don't have the security because, of knowing that you're going to be there for a while? Because once the three years is up, you can automatically then apply for your 10 years and you'll get it. Right, okay. Because it's basically, it's basically seeing, I think the reason behind it I think it's because there's so many flooding in. They've reduced that down, and then they can they can monitor to see how that how these people what what they're offering to the country what, and how they behaving. Is it an encouragement? Like, are they are they trying to encourage more people in? Well, well, the thing is, well, they're not. I don't think they're encouraging or discouraging, but because they're coming in no matter what, they're making the applications. But I think what they're doing is they're going to see is that person going to be a problem whilst they're here in that three years, and if they're not, if we don't have any police record on them and then we can assess what they've done in that three years and if there's no problems they get the 10 years so it's an automatic application it's probably not a bad idea it's probably just gives them a bit of breathing space whilst they're processing you know um rather than just dishing out these 10 year uh sedulas granted mm. here there and everywhere to everyone now it was probably it wasn't so much a problem before but now they're they're swamped you know and they are when you go in when you go into immigrations you see it because you basically this is there's a corner of a building and that is like they've got this ground floor office and it's you can see them all working in and there may be i don't know 15 15 to 20 members of staff in there and they've got a couple of floors above the offices above but that's it dealing with the whole country <laughs> and it and because Nothing's electronic, nothing's digital. There is stacks of paper just everywhere. 
<laughs> I mean, I, you can't imagine the world that we used to live in. How did anybody ever find anything or get anything well, it's done? Fi- fi- it's unbelievable. It worked. I mean, it, it just, you know, I, but, but this is how files can get lost. Yeah. Is how you can pay for a file to get lost. <laughs> before, okay. before the invention of servers and backups. Yep. Well, you can't do that. Yeah. I, I, I know people that have done that, you know, and, and it's, so you go in there, like say it's got going back in time and you'll say, well, uh, here's my, you've got your stamp documents. I need you to pull out my file. And they're literally going over to a stack on the floor. I say, here's your file there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm fucking look. I'm, I'm going. How do you know it's all there? How do you know that every document is? There? How do you know you haven't lost any? And they can't understand a word I'm saying. And then my other question was, um, what happens if there's a fire? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's gone. Everything's gone. Yeah, yeah it's funny, but it, we we <laughs> we've passed our process with the migration now, fortunately. But until there's a fire. Until there's a fire, <laughs> but it's slowly integrating um, digital uh, sort of electronic systems slowly. slowly. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, and I know when you first looked at it, the the draw was pretty much EPV, mm. um, and you know you said they were sort of managing that process. So I'm I'm surprised <clears throat> that are, are EPV still attracting people? Or, uh, no, you know. So what? what Where's the influx coming from? Is that a lot of people that went to EPV from serious places that were struggling, like Austria and Canada, that mm. were experiencing real oh, sort gosh. of yeah. Pressure, I mean, Can- depression. Canada, we've seen some horrific stories, yeah. and and still do actually. Yeah, and and they were coming from places like that. Always places like Germany and certainly Austria have a track record for this kind of stuff and then obviously it was like who it was like a competition between the likes of Australia and Canada of who could be the most oppressive at yep. that time yeah they were in New Zealand yep. yeah New Zealand and anyway so that, so there's an influx from these places and what they found when they went to EPV it was like out of the frying pan into the fire and they didn't enjoy it they didn't enjoy the experience and so what you realize there was um they 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 pitched themselves as this exclusive um, settlement colony, call it what you want. Well, it, I, I, as I saw it, it was kind of pitched as this utopian kind of um, place where you can go, where you can speak freely, where you can meet other like-minded people, where you you could live the way that you wanted to live, mm. you could eat naturally, yeah. you know, you'd have locally sourced products and food. Um, yeah, you know, it, or self sufficiency, self sufficient. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was absolutely. Big, yeah. yeah. So, like you say, it was um, health care that was not controlled by a big pharma, all this kind of stuff, um, which to a degree it has, but it's the uh, it's the way in which it's run and managed by the founders. It was uh, it, it was it was done in a in a very controlled way to the point where it was. It was beyond exclusive. If people spoke out, and you know, I, I witnessed this with other Germans or Austrians that were there, if they spoke out because of the the way it was very top heavy handed, and if people didn't like it and they and they spoke openly about it, they were ejected and evicted from there. And actually, soon what you realise, the place was more about it's a money making enterprise for those to sort of they've bought a massive area of land, they've carved it up into tiny little plots. Well, varying size plots, let's say, of extremely overpriced land. So, did you um, did you invest in it? Did other people invest in it to start with? Was we, that? Yeah, they do different types of investments. They do an investment process there where you can do this staking, where you lock your money up into the you you invest your your money into the project, let's say, into the project. The project being the community that they're building there, and you can do that for eighteen months or two years, and then get a. a eight percent return or whatever they didn't honor the returns i i personally thought that was madness there were people there were europeans or westerners going there doing that um investing their life savings into the place without having ever visited it and yeah, before they even left their own home countries and i just thought it was crazy you, you go there and you hear these stories and we went there and we made a small investment there by comparison didn't like it, got out and 
I continued, I, I invested in Asuncion, as I said earlier. And uh, when we went back to the UK, because uh, it was like our kids wanted to complete their exams and doing their GCSEs and that at the time, I just continued investing and I, I travelled to and from Paraguay, back from the UK to Paraguay several times every year for the past sort of couple of years. And just to try and sort of maintain ties elsewhere and sort of build on a knowledge of the country. So I want to get to know the country. I didn't want to get to know a settlement. The settlement claimed to mirror their own constitution on the on the country's constitution constitution. Wasn't it? It's it's just it's not even close. So um what what I found they were doing in EPV, they were trying to dress themselves up as this alternative spiritual place with this hardened European Austrian style top which, down which governance. Very rules orientated. Yeah. You know. Yeah. A lot and of it, and compliance. It, and a lot yeah. of the a lot of the Germans and Austrians that went over there were sick when they found that, you know, because it's they realised the the clangor they dropped. I think this is one of the issues with immigration in general. I th- I think a lot of people they immigrate because they want to leave um a regime that is too controlling <clears throat> and and they yearn for more freedom and more opportunity. Mm. And then when they get to the next land, they try and recreate the regime that they're running away from. Exactly. And, exactly. And and I think you it's know, just in them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I think it's it's part of the doctrination process that we all go through is living within yeah. a within a society or within a within a country. And it doesn't fit within a country like Paraguay because they're relatively free people. They're free spirited people. It's very relaxed. Doesn't fit in the UK. I mean, we're we're pretty free spirited people, or or at least we used to be anyway. So, yeah, um, yeah. There's a there's a lot of compliance here. I mean, we've always been. I think we was we've always been dominant as a race, uh, but you know, and I'm always told to um, reject reject. Uh, Tyranny, because I, th- I mean, we've experienced two large world wars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and and we're always always led to believe that we are free people, but of course, you know, when you when you sort of do your homework on the history of it all, and you see that those that are sort of controlling those world wars are the same bloodlines that can that are still here controlling us now, and you kind of sort of realise that it's all a load of crap you know that what you've been fed for so long yeah well you're you're an east end at heart aren't you you sort of well brought up in the east end we live in eastbourne in eastbourne right we okay grew up in eastbourne yeah only only family from there family yeah. from there yeah okay yeah well, you, you speak quite east end so well spent a lot of time there when i was um when i was younger so we would do a lot of uh holidays and weekends there yeah so that side, that side, that side that. yeah, that side of my that side of my family yeah. was, used to spend a lot of time there, but live live down here. Yeah, I, it, I, it's just I find it quite interesting because it was only recently I was speaking with my mum and she was uh, uh, she she's been Sussex born and bred for for many years, mm. you know, and um, she used a phrase with me the other day. She said, "You know, our, our Sussex won't be drove." And and basically this yeah what we, is it again we, we won't be drove won't be drove yeah and and basically it was like um a phrase from her childhood that was like you know Sussex are free people and they won't be controlled by anybody else they won't allow other people to sort of determine how they live and how they work and I think you know we we've seen that across all of Sussex with you know the the rebellion in Lewis. Um, in the past, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it seems, and with all our bonfire societies, um, you know, we seem to have a bit of an anti-establishment kind of um, vibe, or, or, or very much a yearn towards freedom, anyway. We do uh, across and, the southeast, and we're also an island nation. Yep, which, uh, and I think that goes a long way within our within our culture of sovereignty hmm. and how we how we think of ourselves. But, um, but I, I so I, I can understand it from our point of view. But I would have thought anybody that, with, with the oppression that was kind of 
pushed upon everybody during 2020, 2021. Mm. I can understand people, the, the desire of people to move to somewhere like EPV and escape it. Um, and I can understand a frustration if you get there and then you find that you're landing in a community that's trying to reimpose the same sort of rules or or uh, similar kind of, you know, society constructs that you have to abide by in order to um, to fit in. Yeah, I mean, there's certain society constructs that most of us are quite happy with. You know, you have to have some kind of order because otherwise you're just living in anarchy. And I don't believe anyone really wants that. They may say they do, but no one really wants that. Not true anarchy. So, I mean, you have to have some kind of order and something you have to have law and order. But, you know, what they... Um, what they impose on you in in that place in that that epv it's a different thing altogether it's it literally is uh run like a tyranny it, it really is you know and so it wasn't it wasn't for me or my family and um it isn't for anyone else i, I mean even that i even know people that live there now that are too heavily invested in it that they feel they can't really they have to try and make it work there but they despise it. And that's really but sad. That, yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> it's really I sad. Mean, I, it, they don't it, feel like there's a way out because they've, they've invested, they've, they've naively invested everything too quickly in a place that they've not really invested any time in, re, you know, checking it out and researching. I mean, I, I, I think what a lot of people have done there is, is a bit crazy. But, you know, <laughs> what can you do? It's... And now it's queer as folk. Yeah. Now it's queer as folk. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, yeah. it is it is a bizarre thing. But um you you would expect to kind of go to a community like that and to find a lot of um uh people that think the same as you. You you'd expect the community to be similar. I, I, I guess we've seen it throughout this whole of this COVID experience that a lot of us that are free thinkers and, and more maverick, we are very difficult to control mm. and and very difficult to kind of impose rules too. So, did that create any friction there? Was it? Um, I mean, you you say people feel trapped. Did, did people not sort of say, "Well, hang on a minute, I want my money back. I'm going to go elsewhere." Yeah, yeah. There's plenty of that that went on and and continues even now. What I found was. Mm, and it, if we look at it, if we start looking at it as uh, um, culture by culture, right, not race by race, but you know, there's the the Germans and the Austrians are very quickly fall into line that I saw culturally, and they they seem to be ready and willing to follow a rule, no matter how. Um, no, no matter how sort of strict it is or nonsensical, they'll do it. And then quickly sort of n not be happy with the situation they're in and want to move on again. And we, we, we saw that, a lot of that. There was also a lot of fear in there. You know, there was a fear to speak out and a fear to act and a fear to do this, that and the other. And I just couldn't work it out. You know, for me, it was it was very clear cut. If we we're not happy with the situation, we move on, you know. Um, and decision was made. We went there. We, did, we made a decision to go there and to check out a place to see if it was right, and it weren't right. So you don't hang around, do you? You just you, you know because time's ticking on. So you got to make a decision to do something else. And like I say, I was simultaneously making other investments, almost like a hedge. You know, if this doesn't work, then we'll try something else, you know, which is, you know, we, we're we building so now. That, that's kind of, that, that that says to me two things. One, one, it kind of says that actually you're quite sold on Paraguay as a country. It says that you yeah. felt confident enough in Paraguay to kind of say, look, look yeah. we really like it here. So, it, and it also says that um, a pre-organised settlement of Europeans mm. wasn't what you were looking for or, mm. or wasn't appealing to you. 
it, it was more about being part of, um, you, you know, living with the locals, I guess. Yeah, we, we never really, despite investing in a bit of land there, and that was against my better judgment, it was more um, when I said to our kids at the time, you know, obviously there's a bit younger, it was a couple of years ago, I said to the kids, well, look, we want to invest in Paraguay, but not here, not in this place. And the kids had kind of pushed and said, well, look, this is a Europe, this is a European settlement. Um, we've got some friends here. They speak the language, at least let it be yep. here. And so there was, there was kind of a bit of that going on. So we did reluctantly put so the investment the, there. And we that, said, well, look, maybe we can build a house. And maybe we can, might be able to make that work. We'll build a house and we'll just have a, a place to like a bolt hole. And then we'd sort of, we would still be looking elsewhere in Paraguay, but maybe that's the first part of base. And we did that, but it was never really going to work. Not not in reality, it was never going to work. So no, I mean, that place is a problem. Paraguay is not a problem. And and as we say, it's one of the one of the few places left really on the planet that you can sort of go to that you're relatively left alone. Mm. It's got a a growing economy. Um, there's a reason why people are flocking towards it. And all these things that, are, that I was kind of weighing up at the time, I was like, well, there's a reason why so many people are still wanting to, to, to come to this country is because it's relatively free. One of the biggest, I think, one of the biggest, um, um, what, you, what would we say? One of the biggest um, underlying factors in what is free is that they they don't cripple people with taxes, they don't cripple their they don't cripple their own with taxes. Well, as as Britain um, or British and, and European know, you know we 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 live under the thumb of tax all the time. You know, and only Look occurred at those to me in the states. Yeah, do, do you know, only occurred to me the other day. I, when I say occurred to me, I really deeply understood. Actually. There's a, there's almost like an orchestrated effort to make sure that we never have wealth. This, yeah. um, this tax on um, uh, heritage, in, inheritance. Yeah. So, you know, it, if somebody passes away, you're not allowed to inherit stuff over a certain threshold and you're going to be taxed heavily on it if you do. And and that's throughout Europe, pretty much. You know, we, I, I've certainly seen the same thing in France as well. And it's all about keeping people suppressed. Yep, keeping them where they it, want it, them. It's not allowing, yeah. you know, I mean, there's absolutely no reason that money's been earned. Mm. It's been worked hard for. They've contributed to society. Mm. There's no reason why that money should be then taxed again, mm -hmm. you know. But that's done. And it's not, it, it's done, A, because the countries are greedy Mm. And, and the governments are bloated, mm. but also because they want to actually keep the population um, a little bit under the thumb and under control. And, mm. and huge taxes do that, don't they? Mm. It, it keeps everybody suppressed. So I really resonate with what you're saying about yeah. tax being a, um, a, a liberator when done correctly. Tax is the big thing. And when you go into countries like that, these underdeveloped countries, this is what you're weighing up at the end of the day. You, you, you go into a country that they they don't impose such harsh uh, draconian tax laws. Um, but then you have less yeah. in terms of the country. Yes. You have less. So then it's the onus is then on you to build that country. Well, so we come a, back to conservatism. It, it sounds a little bit more like the pioneering spirit of the the West in, in America. Yeah. yeah. It, it sounds much more sort of closely entwined with that. Yeah. Um, there, there's nothing there. It's up to you what you do with it. Yeah. We're not going to, we're not going to tax the arse off you. Um, yep. You know, whereas here, um, what can you do here? It's got everything and they keep taking from you. So, so you, you opted out of EPV, you know, and, and mm. you moved away from that. What about your investment in there? Did you sort of resell that on? Do you sell that back? You know, what, what's the arrangement with that? Is is there a, a built-in process to sort of say, 
hang on a minute, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I want to do something else. Well, there is. Uh, so you can you can claim the money back um, in terms of you say, well, I want you, – you can have them buy the land back off of you um, and they would facilitate – um, a new buyer, let's say, or if 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 you if you gave them someone, if if you presented someone who wants to buy your land back, you can do that with them, and they can handle the sale, and you just give them a kickback from the original purchase price. So you weren't reselling the, you wouldn't resell the land yourself. Um, you can resell the land yourself, and you'll just and the what's written into their contract is that you would give them uh, a percentage back on the on the original resale price but uh, on the uh, sorry on the original sale price the uh what you resell it for is entirely up to you but what they do is they frustrate that process all the way through because effectively they don't really want to go through all that again they want to keep the money they don't want it resold you know they want to, they want that land kept and they want to they want to sell you then <coughs> the building package to develop on it that's that's their objective so i said to them well you know you're going to have to we want to make um we want to sell the land back and they said uh, they they made a ridiculous offer a ridiculous offer on the land oh, said, so they didn't buy the land back at the price that you paid for it so they'd, they'd say they'd buy the land back, but they wouldn't give you back what you paid? They said they'd buy the land back. Um, but first of all, we need to find another buyer, is what they said. <clears throat> and then I'd said, well, we have another buyer, but you've discouraged that other buyer. So we will uh, – so now I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to buy the land back off me if you're going to discourage other buyers – because you have to give them first refusal and everything else. They made such a ridiculous offer on the land that I said, well, I'll do better than that or I'm just going to hand this over to a lawyer. And that's what I did. And then the lawyer facilitated the sale and he did that. So, but they, they were, what they try to do is they, they will try to frustrate the process all the way through to their advantage. That's what, that's, that's what they do. And it's not exactly, um, it's not uncommon, it's not unique. I mean, a lot of these landowners oh. do this. We, I mean, it's <laughs> the governments do it as well. I mean, yeah. we, we've seen the cases in the UK recently with them buying the land for the HS2 railway yeah. Yeah. Um, extension, you know, and, and in fact paying, you know, bottom price for it. And now they've decided they're not going to go ahead and develop the, the yeah. railway and now they're offering people to buy back their property at an inflated price. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if that's not daylight robbery, I I don't know what is exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but I mean, no. So so we're 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 done and dusted with that place. And so you've got from what money. I can see, it's 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 run its course anyway. There, it ha doesn't have the interest from the Europeans anymore. They can sort of see through it for what it is. There's so many lawsuits against it. They see so you. As, you got your money back out. You got yeah, we're pay up. yeah we're going through that process now. Um, we actually ditched our lawyer, and uh, we we went with a, a better lawyer because what we did is we upped our claim. So we had the claim of the original land, but then we looked at it and said, well, there's so much grounds for this being a a fraudulent project. Um, we. And and there's also there's also room for this being a, a money laundering project, and from what we see about the characters that run it, their histories on other projects or what they've done before, uh, actually, a lot of it's being looked into. We 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 think there's a strong case to say, not only can we claim back the land. We'll have we'll we'll do a full claim back of false advertising, false sale, and everything. So we've we've ramped up our claim a, a lot more than just the land. So we're and are they viable to sort of pay that? Um, are, if a, are they if a thriving if, enterprise now? If, if if a judge finds in favour of uh, of us, then yeah. yeah, and because there's so many other criminal cases. 
So you you're not alone nah. in terms of doing this. Yeah, no, there's plenty. There's plenty. It's 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 deterred it's deterred so many other Europeans now and Westerners from wanting to 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 go there. I think it, I think it's a bit of a a busted flush. Let's say right. Okay, I, it's, it's interesting because I haven't seen much of this on sort of social media and stuff. But to be honest, EPV was mentioned. You know, going back sort of eighteen months, two years ago. EPV was mentioned quite a few times on social media. It's just pretty silent now. I, I, I certainly haven't come across it. it. May not be silent, but but I haven't come across much mention of it. So no, no. I think the uh, I think the founders of it. I think they've they've split as well. A lot of them because there's too many criminal allegations against the Argentinian who paired up with the uh, the Austrians that had founded it and. He was a political figure and uh, it's wrecked his political career. He has no more political clout and they've just, it's just been viewed as a, a fraudulent money laundering exercise. So Gosh. he's now having to case by case pay people back. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's, um, that's quite a shocker. Yeah. So and and you know you're still if, in contact it, with people that are, are still living there. Are they are they safe living there? Are, they, yeah. are their properties secure they, for them? And they are. They'll they'll be protected. But I mean, if anything, if anything should run as a deterrent for for other Europeans who are thinking about investing there, then you know if they heard this conversation, then they should use this and think twice. I would so say. so maybe if you are looking at, at Paraguay, you know find some other people locally that you can talk to that, you know, you can have some honest conversations with. Mm. Um, yeah, go mm. on. It's interesting. Mm. So I guess really kind of sort of just to, to finally kind of wrap up then really this whole experience of yours of, of going to Paraguay. So the, the good you would say, you know, the the good is what the well the good is the good is the fact that um, if ever you think well if ever you think back to what is the good old days when we could just do this when we could just do that well we're all saying that well the good old days well it was good in them times because you know we could do X Y Z and there wasn't all the arse and aggro um, you know it's like that over there you you are just reminded of it's it's of what things used to be like it's like going back in time that's how i view paraguay um it's not burdened with technology it's not burdened with sort of overzealous um sort of laws and rules that are just sort of controlling your every movement in line it's mobile phone masks every few hundred meters and yeah i mean they they have the technology but you just don't Yeah, I mean they have technology. They're all on, they're all on their social media. You know, it's 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 normal in that sense. But it's just you're pretty much left alone by by the government over there. You know, you're kind of left to your own devices. If you if you if you put a foot out of line, if you're upsetting people and committing crimes, then they'll deal with you because there's there's laws and procedures in place. But other than that, you're you're left to sort of just operate over there, toe the line, and it's then there's no problems. You know they're, they're not interfering into your into your every movement, into your everyday life. You know, and, and your financials, they're they're not doing that over there. So, like for me, it just seems, and the cost of living over there is a lot cheaper. So it has a lot going for it as a country. It's popular, and it has a lot going for it. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So. Um, so that's the good. So the the good is just the freedom, um, the financial independence, the the lack of government overreach yeah. into your life. So what about the bad? <clears throat> what are the negatives, if any? Uh, the bad, the bad. It is it is fairly bureaucratic. Um, possibly more for foreigners. I don't know. Um. If you're going there coming from luxury, 
uh, as most of us Westerners do, and you've got high expectations of what you can get in terms of um, uh, I don't know how would you put it. They have basic living over there, you know. Their architecture, their building standards, the building practices, um, their infrastructure, that kind of thing is still very much in the in, in the dark ages. They're getting better with the more investment they get. But I wouldn't have too high expectations it, on that front. I mean, the whole building stuff is is a it's probably a, a subject that we probably should avoid because we can go really deep on this. But you know, in in the West and particularly um, in the UK, you know, we've been building for many many years, and we've mm. got buildings that have stood for mm. hundreds and hundreds of years, and and our whole building. Um, ethos if you like has evolved over time and we used to build very ornately and very yeah. decoratively and and quite um, um and and quite ostentatiously you know and over time it's gradually become more and more boxy benign and yeah yeah and and Ar the architecture, and architecture is just so yeah. absolutely dire yeah you never look at countries like latin america and think Wow, that's the place to go for architecture and no. stuff. You know, it, that's a European. The thing. only, maybe, maybe the only Russia, part, you know, the only it's... parts of those parts of the world that do have really aesthetically pleasing buildings, buildings and architecture, is European architecture that's there, that's found its way into there. Yeah, only that, you know. Um, but I suppose that's to be expected. So, so I, I, I kind of. So it's not really what what you're explaining in terms of the bad is is really just your expectations in terms of the quality of um, your surroundings and stuff it is not there's not the opulence that nah. that we take for granted nah. in in the West quality of restaurant quality of um, like you say quality of uh, building aesthetics. The infrastructure is lagging, yeah, but that comes down to funding. So there, it has it has lots against it in in terms of that. But these are small prices to pay that can be dealt with. They can be dealt with, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're not. It. Uh, I think if I'm reading you correctly, it's it's not. Um, it's not a deal breaker in any way. Mm. It's just we, we've all experienced it when we've gone on holiday to other countries mm. and stuff. You know, it sometimes they're a little bit ramshackle by comparison with what mm. we would normally um, expect. But then they don't have the same weather issues and and so on that we would normally expect as well. So yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So and I guess you know finally the ugly is. Is there any part of it that you think is you know, it is no, is really not really no? no no. I haven't found any ugly. You always find bits of bad. Yeah, you know, and certainly as a foreigner, you know, you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna find the bits of bad worse than the the natives are gonna find it because you're gonna be, um, you know, you gotta have your wits about you a little bit more. Mm. Let's say, but I certainly haven't seen any ugly over there. There's no, no ugly. No, it's, that's interesting because I, I took a trip to Dubai years ago and, and Dubai looks perfect. On on the face of it, mm. it looks amazing. You know, it's opulent, mm. um, it's vibrant, it's thriving, it's hugely invested in and, you know, it didn't seem there was too much on the bad side of it. But then when you delve below the, the surface a little bit and you start talking to the locals, you know, we were talking to like cab drivers and stuff. Most of them were immigrants that have come in from other countries mm. and they have absolutely no rights. They have no um, uh, protection. They can be told you've got to go home tomorrow. You know, that was the ugly part, you know, that, that nobody saw. Mm. It was like if you were, if you were a homegrown um, from the Emirates, you're protected, you're looked after, you mm. get the best jobs, you get the best opportunities. If you're an immigrant into the country, you can be turfed out like that with, yeah. without a look in. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like with Paraguay, you, <clears throat> there is that kind of um, 
uh, undercurrent of of threat or no, not or, if you do it, not if you do it the correct route of uh, the, the correct migration route. Yeah, you know, you can. Um, it's very he- easy to hop across the border, you know, and be in that country, and operate and stay in that country, sort of under the radar. But um, really, everything is controlled by ID, you know, um, cedulars. So if you are if you are a resident and you've got that cedula, then uh, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. It really shouldn't be too – they're not going to treat you any differently to uh, a native Paraguayan in that sense, in the eyes of the law and insurance and everything else. Yeah. 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 So, so as a country, you'd almost recommend it to people. As, as something for people to look at and, yeah, and think about if they if they really were looking for a change of lifestyle and to go somewhere that yeah was a little bit more uh, of an advocate for freedom and for and um, it, it, yeah the a, lifestyle that a place I think that a lot has, of us it has strong laws it has a strong constitution but is a blank canvas in terms of investment it's 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 not a, it's it's a, a robust country yeah, yeah. and and. I, I guess really to kind of wrap up, um, what would be your recommendations to anybody that was thinking about moving to, to Paraguay or, or was interested in doing that? What what would your advice be? Um, the advice would be like any place you want to go to on earth. I mean, make sure you go there with um, sufficient funding because you – you don't want to. You don't want to go there and get caught short. You know, if you're going to go there, go there with a plan. Go there with. Uh, don't just rock up and think I'm going to make this work because you, time passes quick, and you're going to have you're going to have to sort of find contacts that are trusted out there, good lawyers that are trusted out there that can guide you down the right routes in terms of migration application and everything else. Also, if you you know you, if you're doing land searches out there. There's always scams like there are anywhere. You need to make sure that's um, been searched and sort of ticked off correctly. You know, so you got to go there with a plan and make sure that. Um, I mean, like for instance, go towards an organisation out there. Do a bit of homework. Go towards an an organisation that's well advertised, tried and tested and uh, and recommended and that would be usually an organization that's run by sort of lawyers and people that are that that know what they're doing out there and then you can then you can make more sound investments and more sound decisions that's all i'd say you can't just sort of go out there half cocked with you know not much money around you and think you're just going to make it because if you do fall on hard times you're not going to get anything out there to protect you there's there's no support blanket there's Mm. no No, no, no. you're not going to get any cushioning. No, no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the hard reality of you yeah. know, yeah, if you're going to do it, you you've got to you got go to go out there with a plan and some and a few quid in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. And if you do, it's a, it's a land of opportunity. Mm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, I have to say. Thank you very much, mate, for coming in yeah. um, and, and for having a chat with us. I think, you know, um, so many people in the last few years have been really um, challenged with the way society has been growing and evolving. And, and many of us are looking at opportunity elsewhere and, and thinking, you know, what we should do. So I think it's really worthwhile for someone like yourself to come in and share some of your experience of actually doing it, you know, and, and you know there aren't that many people. I, I I know you say that there's you know the immigration is uh, is quite huge out in Paraguay now, but in reality on the ground in the UK there, there are very few people that actually really do do it, mm. and and there are very few people that actually come back and are able to share that knowledge and that insight with us. So um, I really appreciate you taking some time tonight. No, thanks and, for inviting um, me, and sharing this with us. So. <laughs> Brilliant, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much, mate. And you can have another glass of wine now if you like. Be good for the wine, if nothing else.